So this is an education. Today we have an education talk because I think that every algebra should know the original form of them in order to amplify that. So this is Merengen of the speaker will speak about this. So to another problem and some illustration, please. Thank you. Uh... And thank you for the kind invitation uh, to this seminar and also uh, welcome everyone to this talk. Um, so as uh, Academician Dransky already mentioned, uh, my talk today is going to be about a very classical result in, uh, in mathematics due to originally due to Amy Nyotter. Um, this theorem kind of lies on the border between commutative algebra and representation theory. And so I'm actually also going to give to different proofs of, of this result. Okay, so what what is the, uh, the so the, the structure of today's talk is, uh, is uh, as I mentioned, so two proofs in the middle, uh, but first of course, I'm going to introduce the problem setting. And then at, at the end, I'm going to give an example. So we'll calculate some, some things. Um, Okay, so what, what's the problem we want to address? Uh, well, given a field K and a finite dimensional uh, vector space over this field, uh, we uh, consider an action of a group on this vector space. And of course, an action of, of a group action on, on the vector space is the same as a representation of this group on the general linear group of this vector space. Uh, this action uh, on, on V in turn induces a uh, an action on a dual space called dual action, or in terms of representation, or in representation terms, this will be the counter gradient or dual representation. Uh, by simply, and, and note, of course, in this case, that the action is still on the left. So we're writing the action from the left. So uh, we have now an action on the dual space in, uh, in the uh, obvious way. And this action on the dual space extends to. Uh, an action on on the ring of functions on the whole ring of functions in the algebraic sense now on this vector space so this is actually all polynomials so this is the polynomial algebra of all functionals on 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 v and this uh, action extension is in the same way as uh, previously um, and then if we fix a, a basis, a dual basis or basis of the dual space, if we fix uh, uh, an independent co coordinate functionals or coordinate functions, then of course this uh, uh, this uh, ring of functions on, on V is precisely the polynomial algebra in N uh, variables. And so we obtain an action of this group uh, G on, on the polynomial algebra. And now know that uh, we, we uh, multiply so each element because x1 and xn uh, are, are uh, coordinate functionals, so they are elements of the dual space. Uh, so we multiply by g rather than g, g, g minus, minus 1. So this is actually on vectors. This is now on functionals. And so in other words, what we obtain is, uh, is a representation of this group G as a subgroup of the uh, automorphism group of the polynomial uh, ring um, that fixes uh, the uh, coefficients K. And this group, because we started with, uh, uh, with the linear representation, so this is not just any kind of uh, subgroup of automorphisms, but this is a group of linear automorphisms. So it acts by linear substitution. So at this point, there are two remarks in order. Uh, very often, uh, people just uh, specify the action of, of a group on on the on the uh, on, a, on a polynomial algebra in an in an ad hoc uh, manner by simply specifying whatever. So, if it is uh, let's say a linear action, one just specifies the linear action directly on uh, on, on the uh, indeterminates on the variables x one to x n. And uh, the second, my second remark is actually uh, directly related to the first one. So notice that uh, so far I've, I've mentioned how we extend this action from V to to the uh, co coordinate function, the ring of uh, co uh, to the uh, to the ring of uh, functions on V by taking the functionals. Okay, uh, but this means so if if I'm talking about functionals, these are linear functions, and if I'm talking about the polynomial algebra over the functionals. This means that I'm considering these polynomials as polynomial functions rather than formal polynomials. And this is disadvantageous. If, if, we, if we work in positive characteristic, this can be a problem, of course, because 
uh, we have many more uh, polynomial, formal polynomials than polynomial functions. And so the more, so in, in this case, if this is the case, or if we work in positive characteristic, the appropriate way to do this is to specify the action of this uh, group G uh, in an ad hoc manner directly on, on, on the algebra of formal polynomials in n, uh, uh, in n variables. Okay, these were the two kind of a subtle point, but important if we want to be really rigorous. Um, and so the main uh, the main question is okay we have this action of a, of a fine of a group possibly finite acts uh, possibly acting linearly uh, on on these polynomials and we want to understand the ring of invariants better so we want to gain some insight into this ring of uh, invariants we want to maybe want to describe it maybe we want to determine some uh, maybe we want to uh, quantify uh, so Maybe giving some 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 invariants and so on, some numerical invariants. Anyhow, so very brief history uh, about this. Um, uh, invariant theory, generally speaking, uh, originated in the 19th century with the pioneering work of Boo and Cayley on the invariance of algebraic forms with respect to linear transformations. Uh, and then, parallel to this, uh, Felix Klein was uh, working on the invariant rings of finite group actions uh, on, on C2. And this is actually, so even though this is very old, 19th century mathematical, it's fairly classical, it is mathematics that is actually very much still relevant uh, to today. Um, so Felix Klein's work actually uh, led later. So then Duval in the, in, the, in, the, in the 30s, he also did some work on, on, on the classification of this uh, kind of, of singularities that are obtained by such uh, uh, quotients, by quotients of uh, finite groups. And uh, this turned out to uh, fit very well in the ADE framework proposed by Arnold in the 70s. And nowadays we understand uh, the, the Duval singularities in, in the kind of a, in the modern framework of Mackey of Mackey correspondence, which uh, considers so correspondence between so uh, uh, well, orbifolds, let's say uh, singularities of orbifolds and and Mackey quivers and so on and so forth. So this is very much so even though this is a very a fairly classical topic, this is still very much uh, relevant. Uh, and uh, fun fact, actually, so uh, Hubert discovered his basisats and the Nuchtalensatz and his uh, CZG theorem precisely while uh, investigating, uh, while working on invariant theory. Uh, even though this theorem strictly, uh, strictly part of uh, what can be seen as uh, strictly uh, strict part of commutative algebra. Um, but while he was mainly interested in, in, in the invariance of uh, uh, continuous groups, uh, GLSL, uh, Emin Yotter was actually much more interested in the invariance of finite groups, and this is actually the topic of today's talk. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about the invariance of the polynomial rings uh, for finite groups. Uh, and we'll try, so, uh, Let's let's uh, let have a look at the original proof. Um, well, oh, close to the original proof. It's going to be slightly more generally stated, but it's very much in the spirit of the original uh, uh, the original uh, proof as as um, outlined by Eminiotter. So um, recall the elementary symmetric polynomials and the Newton functions, also known as power sums. Uh, these are very uh, to very standard notions in algebra, we fix a commutative ring R uh, such that uh, um, a ring such such that it contains the uh, the field of rational numbers. In other words, this is a commutative ring of equal characteristic zero. And in the polynomial ring over R, we define uh, we can define the elementary symmetric polynomials as usual, and of course also the Newton functions or power sum functions. Remember this notation because it will um, it will pop up a few times. Times, uh, during this talk. And then, of course, we have the, the Newton identities, or more accurately, the Girard Newton identities. Girard was actually, uh, Girard's work pre predates Newton's work by some 37 years. We have the, uh, the Newton identities, and the point of the, the, the important point here about the Newton identities is that the elementary symmetric functions can be expressed via the Newton functions recursively. This we know already from uh, elementary algebra. 
And here is also the first instance of our first example of uh, an invariant theory. So the fundamental theorem of symmetric polynomials tells us precisely that uh, the ring of uh, invariants under the action of the symmetric group, where the group acts by permuting the uh, variables, is uh, uh, can be described precisely as the ring uh, uh, induced by the elementary symmetric functions. This is the fundamental theorem of symmetric polynomials. And here we have such a description in a very explicit way. And the recursions of the Newton, uh, the Gerard Newton identities uh, from, the, from this slide, from the previous slide, actually imply that we also can describe that we have a different set of generators for our ring of invariants, namely the power sums or the, the Newton functions for this uh, ring of invariants. And uh, the important point here, what we'll need a few times, is that uh, if we, so if we take any n, so if you take an arbitrary high in integer n, then the, the corresponding power sum, the corresponding uh, Newton function is going to be uh, uh, generated by all uh, power sums up to small n. So that regardless of how big n is, it can be written as a polynomial of p1 to pn, p small n. Okay, so uh, before we prove, um, or uh, before we prove the actual theorem of Amy Newton, before we state and prove, we need a small lemma. Uh, it's actually a small, but uh, kind of but very, very important. So we fix again a commutative ring that contains the rational numbers, and we fix a multi index alpha, and we take uh, any finite subgroup of the group of automorphisms of the polynomial ring. Let's say uh, it, it, it has it, it has order m, and so uh, uh, we can define a very a generic kind, very generic kind of invariant. So because uh, by simply fixing a monomial of of, uh, of multi-index alpha and taking the sum over the orbit over the orbit of this monomial. So the, uh, and of course this is well defined because the group G is finite. And this is clearly an invariant. So it's going to be invariant under the action of every element in this uh, finite group G, because basically if, if you, uh, if you uh, let, uh, if, if you apply any, any element of G on this sum, uh, you can just change the, uh, the summation. So the index, it's, it's a multiplication is a projection uh, in the group and uh, obtain the same element. And now the important lemma is that I'm going to prove on the next slide is that um, every every such generic invariant can be written in terms of uh, invariants f alpha, where, however, uh, alpha, so the, the multi-index, is bounded by the order of the group. So no matter how uh, how uh, so how how, how big uh, in a general sense how big beta is, I can always uh, take, uh, I, I will always need only uh, th those uh, invariants f alpha such that alpha is bounded by the order of, of g, so on the group g, which is m. And notice that at this point, we do not assume g to be acting linearly. This is, uh, this is it, it, so far, this is not uh, crucial. Okay, so how do we prove this lemma? There is a very nice little trick. Uh, very much in the spirit of the original proof. So we extend the action of G. Uh, so we, we adjoin further N, uh, some further uh, N indeterminates, uh, T1, uh, T2, Tn. And we extend the action of G on this uh, polynomial ring by simply uh, letting it act as an identity on the T uh, I, uh, variables, on the T variables. And then uh, what we do, and uh, we take the sort of a, a very generic linear form weighted by T, uh, so T1 times X1 plus and so forth, plus Tn Xn. And this is of course a polynomial in, in an element of this ring. And then what we do, we take big PK to be the, 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 uh, the power sum, so the Newton function, what well, is the Newton function over, uh, so to speak over the orbit of, of, of lambda. So G is finite and each variable is uh, some element, uh, a distinct element in the orbit of, of, uh, of lambda. And we can just calculate this very explicitly what it is. 
So uh, we use the multinomial formula, and what we obtain is uh, an expression of uh, PK in terms of our generic in, uh, of our generic invariants uh, F beta. Now remember that PK these are power sums, and we've said that all, all power sums are generated by uh, power sums up, up to the order of, so up to the uh, um, so power sums up to the exponent m where m is the number of variables and so this means that every pk is in this ring uh, generated by p1 to pm no matter how big k is but this ring if we look at the formula this ring is actually a subring of the ring generated by uh, t1 to tn all these variables and uh, because we have at most PM and the invariance F alpha, where alpha is bounded by the order of M or uh, by the order of the group, which is M here. And so what happens when you compare this? So uh, when you compare both sides, if you express it, uh, each PK, especially uh, K big, um, if you ex express it, uh, uh, once like this, and then in terms some in, in terms of, of uh, TIs and F alphas, because F beta and F uh, or F alpha, they're independent of these uh, variables TI, uh, it follows that in fact, the F beta must be polynomial, uh, uh, must be a polynomial in the F alphas. So in, the, in this part, F alphas where alpha is bounded by the order of the group. It's very elegant and uh, kind of uh, a very uh, uh, inventive proof. Okay, and so now we can state the original uh, theorem of, uh, of M. Niotter on uh, on the invariant. So if we fix a, a group, a finite subgroup of the group of uh, automorphisms of this ring, then uh, this the group the ring of invariants or the algebra of invariants is uh, generated by elements by all ele by elements of the form f alpha where alpha so this multi index or by this all generic invariants where the, the corresponding multi index is uh, uh, bounded by the order of the group uh, g of the group g and in particular so if the action is linear so it acts by linear substitution if you remember now the definition of f alpha i'm going to go back uh, okay if you remember now the definition of f alpha so this uh, it, it's a it's a monomial so it's uh, orbit uh, we take uh, the sum over the orbit of some monomial of multi index alpha so if g acts linearly this meaning that it acts by linear substitution then it does of course does not change uh, it does not change uh, the degree so it does not change the grading so it, it respects the grading of this ring and so it uh, and, and so uh, and so the degree remains the same uh, and so in this case, so if when, when the, the action is linear, then uh, um, uh, the ring of invariance is not only fina finitely generated by the elements above, but it's finitely generated by elements of degree uh, less or uh, equal or less than the order of the group. And this is known as Niotter's bound. This is known as Niotter's bound. And how does one prove this? Now that we have established our lemma, it is it is a one-liner, basically, a one-line proof. So uh, we we take a, 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 we take any uh, an arbitrary element of the algebra of uh, invariants f, and because f is assumed to be invariant by uh, hypothesis, uh, then of course it is equal to its average. Well, this is basically what what uh, is known as Reynolds operator. Very often, it's an averaging procedure. Uh, and of course, notice again that G is finite, so, so this is actually so the, uh, is is well defined. And then uh, we simply calculate what this actually means. So this is uh, we take G times F. F is in the, of the above form, and then this means C beta uh, times G acting on this monomial, and then just uh, swapping the sums, we obtain precisely one over G uh, of the sum over some over some betas. Uh, for some f betas, and now you know. Now we know by the previous lemma that all of all f betas are, in turn, uh, generated by f alphas for alpha bounded uh, by the order of the group G. Okay, and this is actually uh, the, the, more or less the classical proof, slightly generalized. Uh, 
no, not because we're not taking just field, uh, but some uh, sufficiently general community frame, and uh, we obtain uh, this this classical result. Now, uh, I want to give because, as I said in the beginning of my talk, um, it is a result that uh, sort of lies between commutative algebra and, and representation theory. We just saw, let's say, more representation theoretic flavor of this proof, and now uh, I'm going to give a second proof. Uh, use, uh, relying uh, uh, more on, on commutative algebra and also uh, uh, slightly more general than uh, than the statement than the previous statement. Okay, uh, just give me a second. So, okay, we need two basic facts from commutative algebra. So the first fact is so let's fix this is this is not, now forget about groups and uh, everything we, we are now thinking about uh, commutative rings, and we have uh, so we fix some notations A B C to be commutative rings with unit, and and then uh, it, we have a very very basic but very important uh, uh, result on integral dependence. This can be found, for example, uh, in T M McDonald actually in any any book on on, on uh, commutative algebra. So if we have a morphism of rings or homomorphism of rings, then the following two things are equivalent. So phi is integral and of finite type if and only phi is finite. What this means, if, if you're not uh, necessarily familiar with these terms, so integral means that uh, uh, this means, so we have this morphism, uh, introduces an A module structure on B, clearly. And so integral just means that every uh, element in uh, B is uh, the zero of a monic, of a monic uh, uh, polynomial with uh, coefficients uh, in, in A. And a finite that just means that uh, B is finitely generated as an A algebra. So this is an A algebra. It's not just the rings, but because it becomes an A module, it is it becomes uh, an, an I A algebra. And a finite type simply means that uh, this is uh, that B is a finitely generated algebra, A algebra, or uh, uh, another term for this is as I said a finite type over A, or uh, an affine algebra, or uh, algebra fine. So they're like four terms for the same thing. And this is because uh, it, it can be confusing. There is also this other term, finite, which just means that B is a finite A module. And so we have this, this equivalence that integrality and the finite type is the same as finite, finiteness. And finiteness should not be confused uh, with finite type or algebra finite. So this is module finite. Okay, and uh, the next result now that we, uh, that we actually need is a kind of famous lemma of Artin and Tate. So if we have if we have a tower of, of commutative rings A B C, a tower of so a tower of three commutative rings, uh, uh, then um, then we have the following. And the way to think about this is now, now if we start with with the, the middle ring, so we start with the middle ring B, and if we know uh, when we know the following about B, B the, the middle ring B is bounded from below by a Neutrian base. And it is bounded from, from above by a finite extension, the finite extension being C. So C is a finite B module, such that, such that C is a finitely generated A algebra. Then this forces B to also be a finitely generated algebra. And because of the previous equivalent, this is actually, so this condition on C being a finite B module is of course the same as uh, B being integral over, uh, so C being integral over uh, over uh, B because C is finitely generated over A, hence it's finitely generated over B and uh, we can apply the previous proposition. Okay, these are the two facts that we actually need. And now we are going to prove, uh, so a very kind of very fundamental, very easy result, uh, but sort of very uh, very fundamental. So recall first of all uh, the following identity for the elementary symmetric functions. Uh, this is this is uh, this probably doesn't even need any explanation. So the, the product of uh, t minus x k is the same as the sum. Uh, uh, 
as the sum with coefficients, the elementary symmetric functions, and the indeterminate decay. And now we fix again a commutative ring. I, I'm not saying anything. I don't, um, uh, any, I don't make any further assumptions on R at this point. Uh, when G is a finite uh, subgroup of the automorphisms, of the ring automorphisms of R, and then for any element alpha in R, I denote alpha k to be uh, uh, gk acting on alpha. Okay, whatever the action is, doesn't matter. And then uh, this very small lemma tells us that any element in R is actually integral over, over the ring induced by the elementary uh, symmetric functions evaluated at the orbit of alpha. And in particular, what this means is that R, so the, our ring R, is always integral over the, over the ring of invariants. And what's the proof of this? So why is this? Because, of course, because the first thing, so uh, this R induced by the elementary symmetric uh, functions in the orbit of alpha, uh, evaluated at the orbits of alpha, uh, is, of course, uh, invariant under the action of G. This is uh, by symmetry or however you want. Uh, and the proof is a one-liner again. So we just consider the polynomial P alpha of T that, that is given as where the zeros are, are uh, alpha, are, are, are basically the elements of the orbit of alpha. And this is, of course, a monic polynomial. And alpha is a zero, clearly, because one of the elements of the group is the identity. So alpha is uh, somewhere here. And so it is a zero of this polynomial. This is a monic polynomial. And once you expand this polynomial by the above formula on the top, you get precisely uh, the statement above, the statement of the lemma. Okay, and so we are going to use this to prove here uh, Aminata's theorem in a slightly more general form. So if uh, given, we are given a, uh, a, a, a Neuterian ring and B a finitely generated A algebra, and G, uh, a finite subgroup of the automorphisms of B that fix A. Then uh, the, uh, the ring of invariance, Bj, is a finitely generated A algebra. And the original version that I proved, so that I proved a few slides uh, ago, was precisely that if we have a group of, uh, of the automorphisms of a polynomial algebra, then the, the uh, algebra of invariance of the polynomial algebra is finitely generated. And this is a slightly uh, more general, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's a more general statement of, of this. And how does one uh, proceed um, to prove this uh, result? Well, uh, first of all, by, by, by hypothesis, B is a finitely generated A algebra, and because uh, Bg is also an A algebra, uh, it contains A, it follows that B itself is a finitely generated Bg algebra, okay? This is just by containment of the coefficients. But by the previous lemma, the extension of B over Bg is integral, right? We've just, pro uh, we've just proved that. And it follows because it is finitely generated and integral over Bg, as we have, uh, as we've, uh, th then it follows that B must be a finite BG module. Remember our equivalence. Integral and a finite type is the same as finite. So B is a finite BG module. And so we are actually in the situation of Artin Tate's result or Artin Tate's lemma. We have a tower of three, uh, of three rings, A contained in BG, contained in B. And BG is, uh, and A is Neuterian by, uh, by assumption. Uh, B is a finite BG module, and B is a finitely generated uh, A algebra. And by Artin Tate, this forces the ring of invariance BG to be uh, a finitely generated A algebra. Okay. So now let's, let's go on and calculate an, an example. Let's calculate uh, uh, an example of, 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 of uh, algebra of invariance. So what, I, uh, what, what we have here is the diagonal group of, of order 2n. As you well know, this is the symmetry group of the regular n-gon. Uh, n is assumed to be uh, greater or equal to 3. 
And so uh, uh, the, the other group, it, it acts on R2. Uh, it has two generators. One is rotation, or is, uh, is, is the rotation, and uh, another generator signal, uh, which is basically, let's say, reflection with respect to the x-axis. And I have given above a, a presentation of this group, uh, one of uh, several possible uh, of this group. But the point is that um, we have, we have we have rho, so our rotation, it acts on a, on a generic vector x, y by rotation by an angle to pi n. And we have a reflection which reflects x, y with respect to the x axis. And this is, this is now I'm going to say something. Uh, this is clearly a linear action. Now, I'm, I'm not saying explicitly what it is on purpose at this point. I'm going to state this in, in, a, in a jiffy. Uh, but it's 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 clear. So you can take rotation matrix or whatever. So it's it is a linear action. So we get a linear action of the uh, of the uh, uh, the hydro group on, on the functions on the functions x and y or coordinate functions or whatever you prefer. And so what we want to do is we want to determine uh, the ring invariant or with the ring of invariants of uh, the algebra C X Y acted upon by the dihedral group of order uh, of order two n, and so one thing to notice here is that we are now working with a complexified version of the very first setup that I presented at the at the at the uh, on on in the problem in the general problem setting. So we kind of we have. Kind of complex we have not kind of but we have complexified our problem so we're working with complex coefficients and so in, in this case what we can do is a simple uh, substitution so sort of uh, taking a complex of course it's a formal variable z we said z is equal x plus i y this is a formal variable and then we introduce also the formal conjugate of this formal variable x minus uh, over i times uh, y and then clearly, because uh, this is uh, this invertible transformation, clearly uh, these are the same rings. And hence the invariants are going to be the same. We can calculate it in this uh, after this change of variables. And now, and this is why I didn't want to state the action before, because now uh, having introduced the complex uh, complex coordinates, uh, we can state the action uh, very easily, so in a very, very, very uh, concise manner. So we introduced a, a, a primitive nth root of unity. So remember that n is greater or equal to three. So uh, uh, so let's say zeta is equal a to the power of two pi uh, uh, divided by n. And then uh, the rotation is, of course, so you know how you have to rotate complex number. It's just multiplication of theta times z. And then for the conjugate is, of course, complication by the conjugate, conjugate of, theta, uh, of zeta, which is zeta, uh, the inverse of zeta, so zeta to the power of minus 1 times uh, z bar. This is for the rotation. And now for the, the action the, for the reflection, of course, it maps. It just swaps zeta and z bar. Because it's a reflection with respect with respect to the x-axis, so it sends zeta to z bar and zeta bar to z. So it's an evolution. Okay, and so um, how, how do we proceed uh, to calculate this ring invariance in a more explicit way? Well, an elementary observation is that uh, a polynomial uh, of zeta and z bar is invariant if and only if it is invariant with respect to the generators of the group, right? Uh, and so what we can do, so what this means is, in other words, right, that a polynomial uh, f is invariant if and only if it is symmetric, because it must be, it, it must respect uh, the, this reflection, which just swaps zeta and which just permutes uh, z and z bar, and we're, that we have this other equation. So this action of rho, it must be, uh, uh, it, it must respect the action of rho. And what we can do, because it's a linear action, of course, it, 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 it respects the grading, and we can do a simple comparison of coefficients in each homogeneous degree. D. So let's 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 see what happens, right? Uh, in for degree one, uh, there are no invariant, there are no invariants there. 
because you, you can just write down the equation and you know that it is a, a primitive end rule. Uh, you know, actually explicitly it's 2pi uh, uh, divided by n, where n is bigger than, uh, than, than 3. So it is a non-trivial, right? It's a non-trivial root of, of unity. And so it, it's not it's not one and you cannot have because you cannot have this equality. So re remember Z and Z bar are formal variables, not, not just something to solve for Z, right? So we don't get any invariance in degree one. So in degree two, however, this, this changes. Yeah. N is three. Sorry? N is three. Yes, N is at least three uh, by the Dihedral group. So there is the general case of N, of N equal two, uh, but uh, well, if someone objects why N is not two, uh, we actually, we end up with the same result basically in the end. So this is more for simplicity than uh, I guess for exposition. Uh, uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, okay, and then in D2, we do the same thing. So we we, we, we take a homogeneous general homogeneous element, and we remember that F is symmetric. Uh, we write this down, and what we discover, so okay, is that, uh, zeta and zeta to the power minus one, they cancel each other, which is great. Uh, so we obtain an equality here, but uh, on, on but on for the second term. So for the second term, this is not possible because again, n is bigger or equal to three. And so in this case, we obtain uh, up to uh, up to scaling, of course, uh, uh, only one invariant, namely uh, z times uh, z bar, which is x, uh, which is x squared plus plus uh, y squared. Okay, so let's consider the general case, all right? Uh, so for degree D, and D is, uh, let's say, bigger than two. Uh, then, so, uh, 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 so, uh, general, uh, so a general term uh, looks like, like this, and then if we apply the action, so we apply above, the, the, the left-hand side looks like this. And so uh, a direct comparison uh, shows that this is possible. This equality is going to be possible uh, if, uh, of course, the, this coefficient CKL is zero, or uh, if n divides L minus k. So I've assumed here I've ordered them so that k is less than L, and here this is the inverse of that. And so in order to get one here, so in order to make this uh, uh, true for any non-trivial coefficient here. Uh, and must divide uh, L minus K. And if N does not divide L minus K, then the coefficient to CKL must be, must be zero. And so what this means is, if we rewrite this a little bit, what this means is that uh, uh, the invariants are uh, basically linear combinations of this form. So this is my ZK and this is my L, this is MN, so this multiple of N plus K. So assume bigger, so L is always bigger than K. Assume, and this can be rewritten, so because we already know one invariant, we, know, we already know one invariant, that namely Z, uh, Z times uh, Z bar, we can rewrite this a little bit uh, like this. So this is Z uh, times uh, Z uh, bar to the K. And then what we have here, what we have here is uh, nothing but the, the, the power sum. Of Z of Z n and Z bar n uh, for the degree n, and now we remember that we can express higher power sums by or higher Newton functions by lower Newton functions. Now this we are going to use this again. So we remember this, and uh, and so uh, what actually seems kind of immediate. It does the formula looks a little bit long on this little slide, but it's actually a, a, a very simple observation. So we kind of apply the binomial theorem in, in reverse. So this is this is so this is the, the, the power sum of Zn. Uh, so Zn to the power of m plus Z bar n to the power of m is of course equal. So this is the first, is of course equal Zn plus uh, Z bar n, the whole to the m, and then we subtract, of course, the, the, the binomials in the middle. Uh, the binomials in the middle. And so we obtain that this is uh, equal to. The first Newton function in the variable z n and z bar n to the power of m plus this 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 expression here that I call q n of z and z bar. 
Okay, but but uh, remember that binomials are symmetric. So they, they have this symmetric formula, they're symmetric with respect to the middle, uh, to the middle term, depending on so the middle, well, not to the middle term, but it, it depends on if uh, it depends on whether m is uh, odd or even. And we are going to do this distinction. And so uh, what we can do, uh, what we can do is uh, to express QM, so this 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 uh, re this uh, um, remaining term uh, can be expressed in terms of uh, z z uh, z times z bar, our very first invariant that we, that we've established, and uh, some lower uh, Newton functions with j in, in, in the variables z n and z bar uh, n. Okay, and so we have to, as I said, as I said, uh, we have to distinguish uh, two cases. We have to uh, distinguish between uh, m odd, or technically m odd and m uh, and m even. So when m is odd, this is explicitly very explicitly we we group the first with the last and the second with the second before the last and so on. We group these terms, and uh, we can then express it precisely via uh, uh, z z bar to the power of kn times uh, some uh, Newton function of a lower order than before. And similarly for, for m even, so if m is even, we get, just, we, we get the symmetry, so we group the terms first, last, and so on, but we have one extra term in the middle, this one, uh, but basically we still get an expression in terms of uh, z and z bar, our original invariant, and, 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 uh, and uh, lower Newton functions. And so what happens is, uh, so uh, let me go back to the original uh, formula. So this was the original expression, PM, P, uh, uh, is equal P, uh, P, P, uh, P, 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 P1, sorry, P1 minus QM. So what this means, all of this, when we uh, recapitulate, uh, all, all of this. Uh, this means that this term PM uh, uh, can be always expressed by z, z bar and lower and lower Newton functions for every m. It can be expressed by z and z bar and P1 to PM minus one. But we can of course apply this to PM minus one. And so in total, this means that PM z bar z uh, bar n can be expressed by uh, z z bar and p1 uh, z n uh, p1 of uh, z, z to the power n uh, and z bar to the power n. And so we found two generators. We've reduced all to two. So we, we've established only two generators for our ring of invariants, which are precisely z z bar and z n plus z bar n. Which can be uh, uh, can be written formally in uh, in a different form as uh, absolute value of z to the square and uh, the real part of uh, z n. Okay, so some concluding some concluding observations now. What happened? This kind of kind of kind of crucial. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, stay, the problem became easier by passing to the complex coefficients, by passing to complex coefficients, because the action was uh, easily, uh, very easily, uh, very easy to state. Otherwise we would have, we would, uh, we would have, uh, we would have had to work with, uh, with, uh, with matrices and so on and so forth, which is generally uh, more, more complicated, more, more, uh, it requires more work. So secondly, well, of course, the Diato group can be as a set, can be given, so in terms of its generators, can be, uh, uh, so we can we can list its elements explicitly, more or less explicitly. And uh, we had, we could have uh, proceeded, remember how the original constructive proof of Neuter's theorem goes. We take, if one takes a generic invariant, so for, let's say in this case, this would be, uh, so uh, one takes a generic monomial, uh, in this case, z alpha times uh, z bar beta, and uh, for with uh, alpha plus beta less or equal than 2n, and, and computes the orbit. So it means that we have to compute quite a lot of elements here. 
to establish the generators according to the original flows, the constructive flows. But uh, in fact, uh, by, by different considerations, we actually got away with only two generators of this ring. So a much more concise description of, of this ring. And the last kind of very important so observation is that, that this Neutter's bound. So remember that if you have a linear action, and so Neutter's bound applies, the ring of invariance is generated by polynomials of degree less or equal the order of the group. Um, it's in, in the uh, it's, it's not always optimal. In this case, we got only so our invariance. So the, the generating the, the, the two generators have degree. So this is degree uh, two, and this is degree n, and this is very far away from two n being the order of uh, of the group. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You have listen that we already talked. We had our thanks to the speaker. If you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. I may have one question if I may. Hear? Sorry, uh, I can try to speak loudly. So, uh, as you said, the bound is usually uh, just an upper bound, but yes. uh, and we can only compute the actual invariance for some special representations. Yes. Uh, but if we fix the group and maybe the field, let it be the complex numbers or as easy as possible, uh, is the bound attained for some representation of the group? Uh, if we, uh, uh, so you, you you fix so what you do you, what you want to do you you fix the group you want to and fix I the group and in you all possible representation. representations and is the bound attained for some representation? No, I don't think so. So you, you want to change different representations? You fix the group, but you change the representations, and uh, you uh, and one hopes that maybe there is a representation for which the bound is uh, obtained. Is, is yes, strict. I ask is, if, if if something in this direction is known or. Oh, I uh, I don't know. I, that, that, that I don't know. <laughs> I, I I don't. So uh, there is there's this notorious gap problem that's been investigated so this is the bound but uh, i don't honestly know uh no if you can so for any group if you can change the representation and to, to, to so to, to, to so we want to make it worse uh, i mean I, I i don't know i don't i don't think so but uh, I, I actually don't know thank you so maybe maybe uh, maybe academician Dransky knows more about this you see, there is an answer to your question, depending on the um, on the representation, um, um, the bound uh, may be different. And even there is a special number, which is called beta of G, which gives uh, an upper bound um, for, for different representations. In, in, um, you can check, for example, some papers by Matas Domokos, and you can see a little bit more about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, I think it's very similar. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, uh, I guess it's quite relevant as well to the uh, statistics. Uh, the generic behavior is seen uh, in your example, like, right? So normally it's very far from. Yes, yes, yes. But sometimes it's, uh, for example, for the symmetric group, it's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's very it's a, it's a suboptimal. It's oftentimes suboptimal. Yes, I, I I could have a question. <laughs> okay, then um, we close the seminar talk. Uh, the next time you want to talk, you um, it will be announced in time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you again. <laughs> Okay, now that the official part of uh, the meeting is over, I will stop recording.
and you can continue uh, uh, in the form of an informal chat, uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, that uh, takes place uh, in a coffee room when uh, the talk is all uh, face to face. So uh, I will now stop recording and transfer the hosting to, to the speaker.